This is Pixelated Audio, episode 90, featuring Brain Lord on the Super NES. Right, you're listening to Pixelated Audio, a bi-weekly video game music and retro gaming podcast. I'm Brian, this is James, and we've got a great episode topic lined up for today. Yeah, in this installment, we're going to be listening to the music of an action RPG for the Super Nintendo titled Brain Lord. And like always, we're going to be talking about the details and the history behind the game as well. Yeah, the track that brought us in was from the opening of the game just after starting up. It's called Dragon Legend, composed by Masanao Akahori. What an awesome first track. It's so dramatic. I really love those really heavy drums. For some reason, I always just love really prominent, slow, heavy drums. And it's just got a great moody tone. It's got a nice kind of 80s power ballad Mm -hmm. kind of thing to it. And I think the rest of the soundtrack really took a lot of inspiration from uh, like pop rock of the 80s. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hear that as uh, as we kind of go through the show. But let's talk about Brain Lord and why we decided on doing this episode. This, in fact, was a suggestion from one of our listeners. Yeah. Um, his name is Cameron Worma. And we uh, he, he mentioned this to us. He's like, you know, you guys should do an episode on Brain Lord. I used to love this game. The soundtrack's amazing. We knew the soundtrack, but we had never played the game. Right. And, and a, a lot of people haven't played this game, and we'll kind of get into that more as well. But, you know, put the game on and instantly fell in love with it. Yeah. It's... It's awesome. It's super fun. Great soundtrack. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun uh, to talk about today. Yeah. I mean, once you get to past the, the title of this game, which just seems like a very just boring, <laughs> horrible title, uh, which doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the game at all. Right. But it, it was just really fun. And, and like you said, we just kind of fell in love with the game really quickly. We already loved the music. So uh, we've had this in our suggestion list for quite a while. And it's, we decided, you know what? It's been about six months or yeah. so. Yeah. And we decided, you know what? We want to do uh, some more listener suggestions. We think that would be fun a fun right. way to interact with some of the people get some episodes that we know people want to to listen to right. so because we got a bunch we got a laundry list now oh so. yeah and this is just a this ended up being a really good pick i think yeah uh so yeah we're thinking like every maybe three or four episodes we're going to do like a suggestion and if you want to get in on the suggestions uh if you go to our discord server there's a like a suggestions channel just for that right. you just write in like what you want we'll kind of like look through it and uh, add it to the list. Also, yeah. you can always email us and stuff too. Yeah. yeah, like if you're not in Discord, you can hit up our website or Twitter, stuff like that. Yeah. First of all, I, I think the reason why I passed it up and you passed it up and a lot of people passed it up is because the name sucks. Yeah. Like Brain Lord. It's like, it's not in, it's not an eye-catching name. It seems kind of dumb. And it doesn't seem descriptive uh, for anything. You know, it, it just, it doesn't really give you a sense of adventure or what the game may be about or anything like that so it's just kind of like some seems like a cookie cutter just mashup of two random words right if i think of brain and i think of lord like combining those two together i come up with like krang from the ninja turtles right i get some type of telepathy or something like that yeah yeah which this game is not really about at all right uh but there is kind of a reason why it's called brain lord i think and we'll get into that but great great track very kind of emotional and kind of has this tone of of somber and sorrow. Right, which fits perfectly into the beginning of this game. Right. All right, so let's get to it. James, tell us about Brain Lord. 
So Brain Lord is a top-down action RPG mixed with kind of a dungeon crawler. It was released in 1994, developed by Produce in conjunction with the sound group Opus and published by Enix for the Super Nintendo and the Super Famicom. Yeah, and Produce, with an exclamation mark, was founded by a group of ex irem employees in 1990 and did a handful of projects with Hudson Soft and Enix. Uh, we talked about them briefly before... Yeah. Uh, the name definitely rings a bell. Uh, yeah, and I, the fact that, I mean, there's so many ex irem like, companies out, out there, there now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so they did Aldenes, which is one of, what, like the six or yeah. so games for the Super Graphics. There were Super Bomberman 1, 2, and 4, Super Adventure Island, Farland Story, and Dual Heroes. Three games, however, stand out in their library. Three RPGs, rather, unofficially known as the Arc Trilogy because they share all the same development staff or development team and all have a bunch of design overlap, even though they're fundamentally pretty different in structure. Mm -hmm. So there's the Seventh Saga, which is probably more well-known uh, to gamers and stuff. It was kind of... Uh, I'd say like a C plus B minus kind of game right. uh, in the RPG vein. There's some really kind of neat mode seven tricks that they did. Um, there was Mystic Arc, which was supposed to be localized in North America under the title Seventh Saga 2, but was eventually canceled and never made it outside of Japan. And then obviously Brain Lord. And those three, uh, they just, they're not necessarily identical in any certain way. There's nothing that you would say, oh, these are definitely, you know, right. sequels or whatever. But something about them just feels like they belong together. Like it is this kind of package that if they were to release like a, you know, produce, um, you know, trilogy, trilogy yeah. or whatever, you know, or produce like 20th anniversary or something, this would be in the set, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's little things here and there, like from what I've read, the main character from Brain Lord makes an appearance or has a small role in the seventh saga games and then Mystic Arc, the in you know, in, in Brain Lord, the main town you start out in is called Ark. So yeah, I mean, yeah. there, there, I'm sure there's other elements that are that are uh, familiar if you're used to all the games. Plus, right. you know, it's made by the same teams, the same, you know, same companies uh, developed and produced it. So even even if you look into like how the menu structure is and, and the design, the aesthetics, it right. has, you know, there might be some tricks in one that aren't in the other, but they kind of they have this overlap. And yeah. I think that that's why they kind of seem bundled together well if the nightmare series can be a series then any game set can be a series because those were three completely different games <laughs> yeah but uh produce didn't last very long yeah so the company went defunct in 2015 but really only existed making games for about 10 years from 1990 to 1999 because after that they just re-released their ips on newer platforms like the vita and things like that yeah so i think they did a game for the playstation and then they uh resold it as a PlayStation, you know, classic or whatever on the the PSP and then the Vita, you right? Know, so. so they did their own porting of their own titles. It seems like right, and it was probably just like one dude holding on to the company, you know, even though it wasn't making any money or anything, and you know, I don't know. But anyways, uh, James just mentioned Arcs, the town that you start in. So let's listen to a track from Brain Lord. It's called "The Town of Arcs," and this was composed by Masanao Akahori. heard the town of arcs composed by masanao akahori for brain lord on the super nintendo you know this track i like but it doesn't really give me like a small town kind of feeling those dark bass notes uh it's almost like a like a swelling or a slap bass a little mm -hmm. bit 
kind of make it sound a little bit sleazy, like a little bit like back alley. Tune. Yeah, I can see that a little bit. There's a little bit more uh, like funk and liveliness to you know this like like uh, medieval type town, I guess. Yeah, uh, this is a pretty like bright and happy. Yeah, area. Every, like, little kids running around and stuff. I don't know. Get, I really liked the track when I was playing the game and I felt like it fit, but now that I'm like listening to it kind of out of context, I'm like, yeah, I don't remember the town being this like scumbally, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I still think the track is really cool. Oh, yeah, I think this track outside of the game is, is you know, it's really fun, it's funky, uh, it's uh, like I said, it's a little more lively than what uh, you usually get for like a starting town as soon as an RPG starts right. up. Like you're you're out and you're walking around, you're you're taking in the different towns and the buildings and you know the NPCs walking around and stuff like that. And uh, it does have um, this look of you know just like a classic RPG, like right. swords and blacksmiths and you know wood buildings and stuff like that. So I can see the the song being a little bit out of place, but well, you know, uh, I keep thinking of like Lunar, right, where the first track. Uh, Berg or the first town, you don't have any percussion really. It's it's very light and mm-hmm. it's kind of bubbly. And this just seems like the percussion is very predominant. And uh, there's like some some like more dark or ominous kind of bass licks in there, I guess. So that's why I kind of, I, maybe it caught my ear a little different. Yeah. Well, and I know in this game there's not very many towns to discover, so right, right, that right. may have played a role in them deciding. Well, if we do with like a really sleepy track. Then the every time game, you go back here, it's right. gonna have a sleepy feel. That's a good point. But it, it did have some energy, and I think that energy made it feel very colorful and um, like oh, for sure, for uh, sure. And I guess it did give it a little bit more of not like an adult feel, but more grown up, I guess. Right, right, right. So right. I did kind of like that. Yeah, not like listening to like um, you know, it's church, not so sweet church hymns innocent, or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, the story of this game is you know it starts off not that unique but i think it it kind of fledges itself out as as you learn more during the game oh yeah like a lot of rpgs it's either going to be like some type of flashback or somebody waking up but right (laughs) so so the story starts years ago the last dragon warrior set out to find the last of the dragons but this man never returned now his son ramir sets out on a journey of his own to find out what happened to his father now, Ramir is not on this quest alone, though. He's joined by some of his friends, and they're not just normal, ordinary townspeople, like some neighbor kid or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you, you said earlier, you know, going back to Lunar, you're like, oh, yeah, some, like, fat towns kid or something. I was thinking yeah. Ramus, like, yeah. <laughs> like, instantly. Yeah, so uh, kind of a, a unique cast of, of friends he's got. Yeah, and they have their own skills. There's, like, Cassian, who is a bounty hunter. There's Barnes, who is a spiritual guru. Rain, a warrior, and Ferris, a witch. And each of them help out along the way. Right. So the town that Rumir hails from has a great legacy that he's known since a small child. His town was once a great village of dragon warriors, and these were people that could tame and fly dragons. So in their land, dragons started to die out, and so did dragon warriors. And so Rumir's father was not on a quest to destroy the last of the dragons, but find it. He had information that the last dragon was possibly hiding in the legendary Tower of Light, but like we mentioned, Ramir's father never returned. So the game skips ahead to an older Ramir, and now that he's older, he's found the location of the Tower of Light and is off to see if he can discover the fate of his father as well as the last of the dragons. Yeah, a lot of the time on the show, we talk about how the story of the game is only like this thin setting for the kind of fun to take place in. You know, it's kind of like a secondary thought. Right. But we both thought that this title, Brain Lord, had a very exciting feeling, uh, like this feeling of adventure from right from the get-go. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it does come off as a little generic, but I think the way it's presented is a little bit more fun. Yeah, and, and it's, yeah, on paper, it is a little bit uh, kind of cliche, like your father goes missing, the son grows up, uh, there's dragons. But I think the there's a neat little uh, combination of dragon riders and that these dragons maybe are like revered creatures that are not like horrible monsters and that there's other places of legend like the legendary tower of light i think it's really cool that there's like this this sense that there is a world that's been living for a long time before you start playing the game and i think that goes with the delivery system too the way that the story is presented so let's kind of rewind here so when the game starts out you start in the town of arcs that's mm-hmm. where you get your, your bearings. You know, you you learn about the townspeople. You kind of learn uh, about your relationships with your friends. And this is where you kind of meet them. So the beginning of the game, we played that track. 
uh, Dragon Legend, and it's this flashback of your your father kind of telling you about what's going on, and it ex- right. explains the game in very simple terms, easy to understand, kind of like if a father was explaining something to a kid. Mm-hmm. Then you know, moving forward, you wake up in a bar, or you you kind of like you get out of your daydream. Yeah, you've been daydreaming. So it yeah. kind of covers both earmarks of of a classic uh, RPG. It starts out with a flashback, and then someone is dreaming. So they were like you know daydreaming, but right. Uh, but I, I, I like it was funny. I like how it takes place. In, you know, you start in a bar. Like yeah. that's that's cool. Like that's not a, a typical location, I guess, for yeah. for starting an RPG. But a little more adult. A little more adult. Um, but it's it's really nice because. This is where uh, you see uh, something on the wall written and there's different kind of like quest, like uh, I guess like help wanted kind Mm -hmm. of posters and stuff. And all your friends are in there and they're just kind of talking and they all know where the tower is. It's not like a mystery. They they're like, oh, yeah, we know exactly where it is, but just nobody's been there in ages. But more importantly, on the financial front, Ramir's companions learned that dragon skills are high in demand right now. And they're even that much more willing to go to the tower and help you out because it, if they can find some dragon scales, they can sell those for a massive payout. Yeah, and it so, sounds like uh, Remus. For, anyway, it does. It does. It sounds like that, Remus. Uh, yeah. Dragon stone or whatever it was, <laughs> the, which was a dragon turd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's listen to a few tracks from inside uh, the town of Arks. There is a track called "Inside the Inn," and this is where you go to kind of save your game and recover and meet a lot of interesting people in the mix. was Inside the Inn, composed by Masanao Akihori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. So this track seems a lot more like a town track. I can see that, yeah. A little more um, poppy, peppy, yeah. cutesy. A little less adult, sleepy. It almost It almost <laughs> sounds like a, like a Kirby track slowed down. Yeah, I can see that, actually. Um, it's very bright and fun. Uh, one thing that really struck me with listening to the soundtrack, uh, I mean, just these first couple tracks we've played... The first track was very moody, very dark and sad and kind of somber. And then this one's very bright and peppy like and complete fun. Like opposite, yeah. Right. And so very quickly, it gave me the sense that this game was going to have, uh, you know, musically, this huge range of emotions that they could display. Like that first track could make you feel really sad and put you in that moment. And this one is really fun. It feels like a great... You know, a great menu to be like, oh, I'm going to shop and look for swords and, you know, look at armor and it's just really nice. I'm going to spend my money um, type thing. And uh, so I like that, that that this game very quickly could show you that, you know, we're going to we can make you sad. We can make you happy and fun. And to me, that is something at the beginning of an RPG that would make me feel like, you know what, I'm I'm ready to be invested in this game. Yeah, the dynamics alone just give you the sense of. Uh, there's a lot gonna be going on here. Right. I wonder what the middle section is gonna yeah, be. Yeah, like or, I'm not gonna ends. Oh. Yeah, I'm not gonna spend like 30 or 40 hours being kind of bored for most of it. Right, right, right. Uh, the track to me actually, I, I really like how it has these really tight staccato ends to each of the, like mm-hmm. the little phrases, but then the echoes kind of keep going. So right. it's like it's like da 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 da, and then it's like dee, 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 you know, mm-hmm. kind of in the back. I like that. I think that's that's really cool. That probably made it sound more like a Kirby track to me right there but yeah i can see that they uh that tightness and the really abrupt endings were really cool and that little subtle echo did add a lot to the track that made it feel not so harsh and i think that can give it that kind of fun feeling right all right so let's move on to our next track yeah so the next track we have is called shopping and we'll be right back
All right, the track was titled Shopping, composed by Masanao Akahori for Brain Lord on the Super NES. Uh, this track is actually a little bit more chaotic and, um, and energetic than what I would have expected, I guess. Still for... a happy mood track. Yeah, but it's kind of like, hey, I have money, but there's so many different things to spend it on. Like, what's that over there? What's that over there? And, <laughs> and you know, it's like, I, I want a new sword, but I want this shield, and, you know, I need this armor, and I got to buy potions and you stuff. Got to buy but... some herb. Yeah, so it was just, uh, <laughs> I liked how the track kind of gave me that sense that um, kind of like would maybe influence the player to feel a little bit more like, I don't know what to do. Like, there's so much, but money is kind of an issue. So Yeah, still a little bit uh, 80s pop rock mm -hmm. going on there, right? It's got a little soaring section. I like that that um, percussion kind of breakdown, a little drum oh, yeah. solo going on there. It's really cool. Yeah, there's some cool stereo panning going on and. Oh, and yeah. that set and it was it was really neat it was like real heavy on one side and and i liked how it had that off balance feel which i think added to the chaotic nature a little bit more too yeah opus actually did a really good job with utilizing what the super nintendo could do and what's really cool about the company or about this game rather is that they get their name right there on the title screen mm -hmm. so we have produce and right below them is opus and that's awesome because they're a relatively small sound team and having their name right there on the title screen not a lot of companies got to do that yeah so, so that was very cool yeah that was very cool and that be that's because really they dipped their hands into us all sorts of aspects of the sound in this game yeah so a little bit more about opus is they like we said at this time were a very small japanese development team specializing in game music, sound design, and simulator acoustic production. So like we said, that's really cool that a small company got their name right on the title yeah. of you know, a, a, what was hopefully going to be a big game. Right. Um, they were established in March of 1990 by Takayuki Suzuki, and they've worked on numerous titles over the years and still operate in Tokyo today. So the company has grown since then, but they're still considered relatively small. Right. If you go to their website, you can see little interviews they have with some of their sound staff. Now, they're, they're not just a sound team. They specialize in sound and music and stuff like that, but they also do development mm -hmm. and they do programming and all that stuff as well. But their, their big emphasis, especially in the, in the early nineties was game music. Right. And so that's what they were kind of known for around this time period. They worked on either sound or development for over a hundred different titles. Starting with the TurboGrafx 16, they did a title called Moto Rotor 2. And then moving over to like uh, a few other games like Cybernator on the Super Nintendo, uh, which has a great soundtrack. Right. Very cool game, too. There was Super Back to the Future 2 on the Super Nintendo, Fighter's Destiny 1 and 2 on the N64, uh, other titles like Bubble Bobble Evolution, Half Minute Hero, and Luminous on the PSP. Uh, Blue Oasis on the Wii and Project Stillfeed on the Xbox 360. So they've had like so much and covered so many platforms pretty much everything from the 16-bit era up they've had their hands in yeah so they worked on a lot of different chips and all the way up to like modern modern recorded stuff, music yeah. so yeah so for their sound team when this game was being developed they had three people working on it there was the uh person who started the company takayuki suzuki who was the sound director june enoki who did the sound and sound effects and maybe some of the driver work and then there was masanao akahori who did all of the composition and music for the game why don't we go ahead and get into one more track and then we'll talk about some of these individuals a little bit more the next track we're going to play is called the road to the tower and this is where you kind of take off towards your first kind of destination in the game You just heard Road to the Tower, composed by Masanao Akahori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. So we were saying a lot of the uh, tracks in this game have this 80s pop 
rock kind of feel to him. This one seems like it strays away from that and more into like a Japanese kind of maybe like mellow rock kind of feel. Right. Like we hear this. I guess it just has more of a a Japanese video game kind of aesthetic to it. Right. With the, you know, like the syncopated bass or the um, kind of like galloping bass and more of those kind of like harmonizing leads and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this is some adventure music. This is, you know, you're not yeah, in a town. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you can definitely tell that now you're out. Uh, you can't, maybe you can't tell how deep into the story you are because it does have some some darker parts to it, uh, some more dangerous sounds, um, but it's still kind of fun and like... Very overworld theme. Right, yeah, yeah. right. And I mean, it's got some very complex notes going on in the composition mixed with that, like you said, very galloping kind of heroic sound that, uh, you know, just makes you feel like this is designed for you, the hero, to have fun and go out there and have your adventure. So Yeah, I like this track. I thought it was really fun. I thought, mm-hmm. I thought it fit the mood fit the game very well so, yeah. yeah well and i'm sure like you spent a lot of time right in the beginning kind of getting your bearings like we said in arcs and now you're out it's like you're out the gate and let's go have our adventure so i i liked that it had that feeling of you know the floodgates are open like go kill some stuff yeah so let's talk about the sound team a little bit at opus okay so june Anoki, the person we said that was probably responsible for sound design and sound effects, stuff like that. Um, It's really unclear what his role was for this game, but probably sound design and sound effects if we look at their previous work. So he's credited for sound and engineering on a number of other games like Nosferatu, Excalibur, Ark the Lad, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and probably 20 or so other games. And he's also done some composition too. Yeah, so this game, the actual credit that he's given is just sound. So we're assuming that that's you know, sound effects, sound design. And again, like you said, you know, if you look at his past stuff, it kind of fits. It makes, right. it makes sense. And there's obviously a credit for music. So we know that they made a distinction right. there. Sound is just a very generic term that, uh, you know, somebody that's going combing through things is just <laughs> right. going to, it's a little open to interpretation. Yeah. Now, the composer, Masanao Akahori, uh, he's been doing both music and sound as well, more heavily on the composition side, though, and worked nearly all the time with June Inoki at Opus. Originally, he worked at another sound company called Goblin Sound and then moved over to Opus soon after to work primarily on their home console game soundtracks. Starting in 1991 with a composition for Magic Darts on the NES, he then moved over to Cybernator, which we had mentioned earlier has a great soundtrack, Super Real Mahjong, the whole series, he kind of touched on that. So real. Yeah, so real. And Rama 1 Half. X Squad and Silva Saga 1 and 2. And I guess those are pretty popular series. I'm not really familiar with them other mm-hmm. than just knowing some of the music. But interestingly enough, he did some work outside of Opus for Electronic Arts, porting some of the music from Ultima Underworld to the PlayStation. And then he did a bunch of sound design and engineering for EA also with Mirror's Edge, Need for Speed Most Wanted, FIFA 2001 and 2003, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Escaban and finally did localization for Burnout Paradise and Burnout Dominator. I was really confused by that. Like, he did localization too? Man, this guy's a jack of all trades. Yeah, I mean, working for a small company, you know, you get to be like that. Yeah, but apparently he's still doing game audio work today, so that's that's pretty cool. That's very cool. It's always great to see composers that are still making a living doing what they enjoy doing. Yeah, so let's hear another track from Masanao Akahori. This is titled Before the Journey. That was Before the Journey, composed by Masanao Akihori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. I like that grunge guitar mm-hmm. thrown in there. It's, it's really nice. Yeah, it's very rocking. Uh, yeah. It also has very sharp ends to the notes like we were talking about before, but that underlying melody is much more soft and... Uh, you know, vague, like, which adds a lot to this track. Yeah. I think it's perfect, though, for getting you right into the action. It's very, oh, yeah. just like punchy and, you know, like 
energizing, a lot of uh, just aggression coming out right mm -hmm. in the beginning. It's, it's excellent. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, got to have a rock and track for some aggression. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, the game a little bit and the gameplay because honestly, I fell in love with this game. Really yeah, did. it was very fun right from the beginning. So this is an obvious RPG with great real-time battling elements that takes place mostly in dungeons with a heavy emphasis on puzzle solving. So it's kind of like brute force and brains mixed together, which yeah, is kind of neat. Yeah, and that might be where the brain lord came from. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> That's what, that was my whole point when I was talking about it earlier. Like, uh, there's kind of a little reason, I think. It's like the lord of how you use your brain. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, th yeah there's definitely some smarts involved in this game. But right. for the most part, it takes place in this pseudo top-down adventure similar to Ease or Legend of Zelda where you control Ramir and he can have up to two sprites or fairy creatures following him on the screen at any time. They are doing such things as long-range attacks and healing, etc. And they're controlled by the AI after they're summoned. Yeah, this is really like Ease. Yeah. I'd say, you know, minus... You know, easy doesn't really have a huge focus on puzzles this does so mm -hmm. it's a little heavier on that side if you you know weigh that the ends of it but it it plays a lot like an early ease game the right. action elements everything just kind of feels like an ease game yeah and one thing that's really cool about these little creatures that follow you is they can be leveled up by collecting blue xp orbs that are randomly dropped after battle where you collect gold for being victorious. So it's kind of neat that like they get to level up, you get some stuff too. And, and you don't get really in the way of each other. Yeah. yeah. Do, do your own kind of things. Now, the game has five dungeons to explore and solve puzzles in. There is the Tower of Light that you start off with, uh, the Ancient Ruins, the Ice Castle, Drogue Volcano, and Platinum. It's really cool too that this game you know like most games it covers the tropes there's like the icy level there's the hot level yeah um and, and then platinum yeah which <laughs> is probably some type of like futuristic fortress or some unknown technology for I them or get, something like that I didn't, but, I didn't get that far i played i went in about three hours deep into this game maybe a little more and uh man i, I barely cracked that first that first that first tower oh yeah and i thought that it was really cool too that the tower of light is the first one yeah so you kind of expect that that's where your journey is going to end but you know it's kind of like right you get the there and then here's another clue just because your father went to the tower of light to find that dragon doesn't mean that's where he ended up so mm -hmm. uh, i thought that was kind of neat uh, but there is only one other town, actual town, in the game, and it's called Toronto, <laughs> which <laughs> yeah. is an interesting choice for a name, but yeah. it serves a really fun and unique purpose in this game. So in the town of Toronto, there's a battle arena where you can go at any time and battle for money, and you can also go there to bet on other competitors. So I that's, thought that was a neat element. That's cool. That's cool. I like that. So, yeah, it's a very cool idea where, you know, money sometimes in games is uh, kind of a hard painful thing to grind for so this is a fun way to earn some money and earn some money maybe by doing some betting so yeah if, or if you have uh too much money and you're kind of bored you can go just, waste it you, know, <laughs> you just at, want to go spend it yeah yeah instead of like you know grinding away in dungeons so uh, but also like you would expect in any rpg there's plenty of weapons to stumble upon or acquire along the way there's like bows and arrows boomerangs swords axes and my favorite are the flails uh, which have a great animation to them. But, I mean, those are basically maces or morning stars. So right, right. Incredibly brutal weapons. Nothing majorly unique, like no crazy, amazing sword like yeah. that you're like hunting for or anything like that. But it's fun none nonetheless. Yeah, and I think what makes... You're right, it's not overly unique. I mean, these weapons are all kind of your standard thing, right? But what makes it fun is the way it's delivered, right? So it's an action RPG. In a normal kind of turn-based RPG, you have to kind of look at, um, you know, the weapons that you're getting and think about how you're going to be using them in that static battle, which is basically like a roll of the dice. Right. Right. And for this, you actually get to see these weapons in real time. If you have a long sword, you get to see that extension when you're using it out on the field. Mm -hmm. You get to see your bow and arrows, you know, shoot across the play field and nail enemies. Your boomerang, you get to actually see it moving around the screen and come right. back to you. And like you were saying, when you have that flail, you can see his arm spinning and things like getting in the path of it and just, you know, getting destroyed. And I think that that delivery system, the way they did it with the real time action elements in battle made it more of a kind of unique delivery than just the weapons aside. Oh, yeah. I mean, now as an adult, I, I can appreciate a static turn-based game, right. you know, like Shimagami Tensei or something like that. But as a kid, I think this would have been a great game for me 
they would have really ushered me into the RPG genre, like the action, seeing, you know, you cutting down enemies, seeing the cool animation, stuff like that. But, right. and, you know, alongside with the weapons, there's really cool armor and shields that you can acquire along the way to help you out as well. Yeah, like shops and sometimes hidden areas. There's a lot of hidden weapons yeah. around. Like, uh, we'll get into more of that later. But, you know, it's just the the diversity is all about discovery, I think. And, you know, it'll be a bland game probably if you just, buy everything at the shop and do everything right. there. Um, but again, you know, as you play through the game, you start to uncover more and more. And it makes, I think the, the wealth of, of, uh, weapons and shields and armor and stuff more diverse, I guess. Oh yeah. All right. So let's get into a few more tracks. The first track is called road to Toronto. That second town, the only other town in the game composed by Masanao Akahori. You just heard The Road to Toronto, composed by Masanao Akihori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. The Death Road to Toronto. <laughs> yeah, it's there, pretty extreme. <laughs> uh, that was an excellent track, and there's probably only one other person that got that joke out there, but uh, really cool track. I thought this was incredible. I mean, this is one of the stars of the soundtrack, I think, and it just has so much pop and rock all kind of mixed in. I really love the, uh, it's almost like a, some kind of like like a clarinet that's going do 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 yeah. do yeah I love that I, I don't even know what that is it just it sounds so goofy but so badass at the same time yeah I mean this track right from the beginning feels so like neon eighties nineties oh yeah big time uh, and then there's that that flute that comes in and there's all kinds of cool little riffs and samples. And then I really like the subtle use of the guitar. I mean, it, was, it wasn't like the star of the song, but it, when it came in, it made itself known. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it just kind of jumped in there. It was just like, damn it. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm like leaving, like, uh. uh that, that high end instrument towards the, um, right before the loop, it's the melody, but it, it kind of gives, I, I don't really care for that sound so much. But it worked in this track, mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't, it didn't bother me. But it was, I was kind of trying to really focus on it. It does have kind of like this, your very typical Super Nintendo high fluty sound. It did, yeah. And I usually don't care for that so much, but 
I, I did like the execution, and so that made me mm-hmm. totally cool with it. The track is excellent, though. I, I didn't have any gripe about it. I thought oh, it was awesome. yeah. It's a, it's a great track, but you do start to, to be able to pick out some classic Super Nintendo sounds. Like, the guitar is very, like, Super Punch-Out, you know, yeah, sounding to me, yeah. because that, that game really uses that kind of guitar a lot. and A lot. Um, but it's it's not bad. I, it immediately makes you think Super Nintendo when you hear it, which is pretty cool. Right, right. Uh, Okay, so let's get into our next track. So we heard the road to Toronto. Uh, What happens when you get there? Well, let's listen. This is the town of Toronto. was the town of toronto composed by masanao akahori for brain lord on the super nintendo now this sounds more like a town track than that first track to a me bit. anyways uh that that percussion line though those heavy hitting drums are are very very noticeable yes uh, <laughs> that that's the difference between some of the other you know town music we hear in other games that and the bass is it's so low it's so deep it's almost inaudible mm-hmm. it's 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 pushing that threshold of the super nintendo it's it's quite it's quite deep uh, but I liked it. I thought it was cool. Yeah, I mean, this gives you a, a totally different feel than Arcs. So I liked that. Um, it, those drums are very heavy and bouncy. And they're also kind of um, like typical. It's just like boom, boom, ch- boom. Yeah, you know, yeah, So yeah. like what's nice about that is that it's very, you know, kind of cliche drums. Mm-hmm. But you can add a lot of stuff to it. And it can it can go with a lot of different things. So like in this one, it has that soft elevator kind of sound laid on top of it so even though those drums are really heavy and harsh it still has a very kind of soft feeling to it it's not like very um like aggressive still it's it's, it has that kind of delicacy yeah there's like a delicacy to it that those drums can kind of add to which i liked a lot there was a lot of scaling and stuff like that which is really cool kind of showing off Uh, Uh, the little flutters and stuff yeah Yeah. which was really nice that kind of added um more to that kind of generic drum it, it kind of gave it like this life to it which i thought was pretty yeah cool. it was like the drums would hit and you get this like burst of like flowers blooming and bees buzzing and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean and those drums were very bouncy and to me sometimes when when tracks are very bouncy they kind of have like a like a dumb feel like kind of like a fun in like a dumb way oh um, like a like a like a dopey kind yeah kind of like a dopey feel um but that very beautiful soft kind of subtle song on top of it really influenced the drums to feel more like uh, energetic i guess yeah or right, so a little bit more about the game uh the world kind of everything is is really similar in what you'd find in the ease game we kind of mentioned that you know mm-hmm. not really a lot of towns anything or anything like that but the more you learn and gather information about the world, the more you can travel. And these paths are all pretty linear, but it doesn't really matter. Right. You know, we were saying earlier, you know, there's a lot of exploration in these kind of linear areas along the way to keep your interest going. And that's so important to any kind of game to give you some kind of feeling of discovery right. as you're playing. If it's if it's just like a straight shot, you don't really feel like you accomplished it. You feel like you just 
got to the end, right? Right. You just put in the time, which that's one thing I really love about like more dungeon crawler type games is you can either kind of just force your way towards the end and get through the dungeon, or you can spend a lot of time if you feel like it to explore Explore all the nooks and and crannies mm -hmm. and find hidden areas and, you know, that maybe someone else won't, won't find, which is always really cool. Yeah. Kind of like a Zelda game or something. Mm -hmm. Even the towers have some twist to them. You know, you, you think you just go up and, you know, defeat this boss and you go down, you're done. Right. But things don't always go as planned. And what I mean by this is I got through the first one and it really threw me off because I was expecting to find a dragon at the top. You right. Know? And instead I find out dragons haven't even been there in years. Right. Which is kind of a cool <laughs> twist. It's like, wait, what? Uh, however, I did find some dragon scales. So I figured at least, hey, you know, I could buy some sweet gear, um, some upgrades, you know, new weapons, stuff like that. But when I got back to arcs, the demand, I guess, for dragon skills had gone down the drain and they weren't worth anything anymore. Mm-hmm. So I was like, what the heck? This totally threw me off. Right. And that's one thing I really liked about this game that felt very charming is that it's kind of sets things up in the beginning to be very kind of cliche. Like there's the the flashback, you right. wake up daydreaming. And so you kind of feel like you know what to expect. Like you, you feel like there's going to be a dragon there and then there isn't. And then you feel like, okay, they said these things are going to be worth a lot of money, so I'm going to go sell them but you can't. So I liked that they kind of, uh, they kind of definitely made a choice to kind of kick the, like the tropes to the curb a little bit and kind of play with the, the, the player. Right. And this kind of goes back to, you know, I've said this a few times now, the delivery of the content, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah, it seems a little bit obvious in the beginning what's going to happen, but they, it's kind of done in a little bit of, I guess a little humorous mm-hmm. way, a little bit intended to to be like that, and it makes you think like, is this is this really what's going to happen next? Right. So that I think that's what I liked about it, you know, and all of this kind of just goes with the story, and I'll kind of leave it at that. I don't want to spoil too much because I got further than you did, right? Yeah, and um, and everyone should get to the end of this game, and it's it is really fun in the beginning. I think if you try it out, you know, get past the name Brain Lord. It's not a great name, <laughs> but um, you know, once you start playing it, you're just like, wow, this is actually really cool. Yeah. And after you learn that there's no money in the dragon skills business, your buddies find that there's other ways to make cash right. in another village, Toronto, basically. And that's where, you know, like the whole betting system and stuff comes in. Anyways, the seventh saga was released just a year prior, but one of the major gripes that people had and critics had was the script and the dialogue. It was a lot more wordy than Brain Lord. Mm-hmm. And that might be because Brain Lord had... Uh, the translation only allowed like a certain number of characters to fit. So they had to be really concise. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's where, why it got kind of condensed. But some of the jokes in Seventh Saga were just kind of dumb. Yeah. And we've all been there. We've all played games that, that just we're like really trying to be funny about. and they're not. Yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, it, it really takes you out of the game when there's something that you really want to happen. You're like, oh my God, come like, on, that joke. Like, like that's like Resident Evil for me. Now. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, there's so many games that are like that. And uh, it's, it's kind of neat to see that this game came out so close to the previous and it seems like they really listened to right. some of the, the things that people wanted that and there was also somewhat of a disconnect between the characters in seventh mm-hmm. saga you know brain lord on the other hand seems a lot more about you and your friends and how you handle the situations thrown at you almost like the plot is driving you but is kind of like secondary right right and we you know we touched on this and i i think that that is the selling point for this game oh yeah and that's that actually i think is a great um, indicator that the story is good when it's very important to the, to the game is the story, but it doesn't feel like it overshadows anything. Like there's a good mix between, you know, what you are doing and what's driving you to finish this game and what you're actually doing in the game. That's fun. Yeah. So let's move on to our next track. This is called natural cavern composed by Masanao Akahori for brain Lord on the super Nintendo.
That was Natural Cavern, composed by Masanao Akahori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. Another really fun track. I mean, I keep saying it for, for these songs, but this soundtrack is just really fun and lively. I mean, this is this is a song I could listen to over and over outside of the game. Oh, yeah. I think it's it's really heavy hitting. There's some, some funkiness to it. Very some, 80s. Yeah, some jazziness. There's even a little rock in there. Um, Again, those guitars come in. Yeah. Just kind of... It's like... Dude, and, and then disappear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought it was really, really fun track uh, where... You know, playing around with a lot of different sounds and samples and, you know, instruments, stuff like that. It was just really cool. Yeah. I like the little duck voices. The <laughs> yeah. That was, that was funny. Um, yeah, that bass line is really cool. I wonder if we can find that. Uh, Super Nintendo is kind of all over the place. You want to try to listen to that? Oh, yeah. Quick? All right. So I think it's, we'll try channel, I think it's six or seven. Let's try this. looks like it's kind of all over the place like they use the channel for whatever they can throw in there right yeah there's a lot going on (laughs) (laughs) yeah it just kind of just kind of comes in when it needs to and lets the uh, the rest of the instruments fill out the channel. Mm-hmm. We have kind of touched on the Super Nintendo hardware in the past. It's yeah. kind of, I mean, it's not new to the show. We don't do Super Nintendo games a whole lot. And there's nothing right. against Super Nintendo music at all. We typically kind of side on the FM stuff because that's kind of what we're into. Right. But there's a ton of great music on the Super NES. And oh, yeah. I mean, that Sunset Ri- Sunset Riders episode we did was really fun. Oh, I mean, that yeah, wasn't yeah. just on the Super Nintendo, but, I mean, it still was really fun. I was trying to think of games that we did, like, complete, you know, Super Nintendo spotlights, and there's only one I could think of. Treasure Hunter G? Yeah, Treasure yeah. Hunter G, which was, like, in our first five episodes. Yeah, and we had, like, Turtles. Uh, that Turtles episode we did had Super Nintendo in it, but also Bob. had Genesis. Oh, yeah, Bob, Bob. But that also had Genesis as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Jim Power had a Genesis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's, so that we've kind of touched on uh, the hardware a little bit, but to run through it again, it's always good to bring it up for a refresher. Oh, yeah. It's been several episodes. Yeah. So the Super NES has a dedicated and almost completely independent sound processor called the SSMP, manufactured by a gentleman at Sony named Ken Kutaragi. So a little side note here, something you might not be aware of, is when the Super NES was in the planning phase, Nintendo went to Sony, specifically Kutaragi, looking for a possible wavetable chip for its system. And Kutaragi, seeing how absorbed his daughter was with games, saw huge potential and was like, yeah, sure, Nintendo, we'll put something together for you. But a lot of big businesses still saw gaming as a fad and really had no interest in pursuing it, especially the executives at Sony at the time. They just did not care at all. So in secret, Kutaragi went back to work and both designed and built the SPC-700, which is the CPU aspect of the sound system. When the Sony execs found out about this, they were pissed and he probably should have lost his job. But luckily, the CEO at the time, Norio Oga, uh, did give him support and allowed him to finish the project, which obviously worked out for Sony because he later went on to create the PlayStation and became the group CEO of uh, Sony Computer Entertainment. Right. Fun I mean, fact. <laughs> it's so cool that he took a risk. Uh, he saw the potential. The company he worked for it was massive, didn't see the potential. And I mean, he could have potentially lost his job and that could have been the end of his career even i mean yeah being let go like that would have i mean another company might have been like eh, we don't want this yeah. guy's liability if my boss is like oh yeah we don't like this kind of stuff and i start working on it i would probably be let go yeah uh, real quick so um the guy had some some huevos and i'm glad he did because right. you know like we got the playstation <laughs> because of it you know mm-hmm. sony might not have been in the game industry well and and we saw that very brief marriage of nintendo and sony that didn't work out but uh, yep. i mean that that goes to show like that's really cool it was more like a uh, a marriage between kuragi and nintendo i yeah. think so <laughs> yeah. you know you know so uh back to the nes sound system the ssmp uh, it's a two-part unit. So there's that 8-bit CPU, the one that kudaragi san made uh, that we just mentioned, called the SPC-700, which runs all the audio software, driver, all that stuff. 
and the other part is a digital signal processor or DSP and that's a 16-bit 8-channel or 8-voice PCM processor responsible for mixing channels, uh, stereo panning, adding echo, envelopes, and all this stuff to the samples. We've compared it to something like the Amiga, like an Amiga module or mm -hmm. something like that before, and that's exactly it. It's just a bunch of small PCM samples that get loaded into the SSMP's RAM, and the SPC700, that CPU, figures out what needs to go where and tells the DSP how to make the music and how to mix it together, and then that sends it out to the audio port on the back of the system, and we get to enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, so the nature of the sound system, being that it's kind of independent from the rest of the SNES, makes it really easy to, you know, for the most part, to extract the audio. Uh, the sound system shares, like, I think it's like 64K RAM or something with the DSP. So just doing like, uh, like a memory dump or something while a song's playing is all you need to grab the audio out. And then we get the audio out, we actually collect all these little memory dumps and bundle them into a container, which is the SPC format. So if you're looking online, like uh, snesmusic.org, they have all these SPC sets, mm -hmm. and that's what it is, basically memory dumps of, e a collection of memory dumps uh, with like header and stuff on there to you know explain how to play the, the music back. Right. That's how we're listening to it today anyways. Uh, so yeah. that's, that's the Super Nintendo sound system. <laughs> yeah, so with all that new knowledge, or maybe not so new knowledge, I think it would be good to listen to another track. We have plenty more to go. So yeah. uh, what do we got next? Next up is Giant Roach, and we'll be right back. Right, that was Giant Roach, composed by Masanao Akahori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. Wow, I mean, we haven't heard anything like this yet in this game. I mean, that was super fast-paced, very intense. Uh, the beginning of the track reminded me of like a Turtles boss. Uh, I was just going to say like, hey, uh, Opus, Konami called. They yeah. want their samples back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, it was very cool. I liked when it kind of uh, transitioned away from that. Uh, so fast-paced, so heavy hitting, so much going on. I mean, this must have been one giant roach. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, I really didn't care for it in the beginning. I was just like, meh, kind of bland. Right. But, man, it picks up in the best of ways. Mm -hmm. It just it gets uh, really, like, epic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, it's almost like the beginning just sounds like you're digging your toes into the dirt and then you know when the the gun fires you're you're off on the race and when you break from the pack and you know you're riding forward or whatever like that's when the track really hits its stride and just it just hits all the right buttons for me and it, just, it was a fun excellent track yeah i mean the very beginning but it's so heavy hitting and so much going on it's almost like a shock and then yeah. uh, you know it's kind of like being seeing whatever this boss is you're just whoa and it gives you a second <laughs> to kind of whoa yeah to be overwhelmed and take it in and then it's kind of like all right i gotta do this i'm you know and kind of like you said like now it's time to actually you know take action and so the song kind of transitions into this more epic kind of battle which i think is very cool you know i i looked up giant roach for brain lord just to, because i didn't make it that far yet mm -hmm. and uh, i was i thought it was gonna be a boss i think you're writing on these giant roaches. Oh, I crazy. Think it's like a, I think kind it's like, like a race. kind of race or something, or you're getting, well, maybe not a race, but you're like trying to escape something or That's pretty something. cool. No, well, I could be wrong. It's very intense, whatever yeah. it is. So. I really want to get to this part. I really want to know what it is. Yeah. Giant cockroach riding on top of it? <laughs> That's it. I'm sold. Yeah. Ugh. Very different. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked about the gameplay, but the look at the game is really important. And I think mm -hmm. it's what 
maybe sold us on it a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, we didn't really play a whole lot in the beginning. I mean, we, we fired it up and we we're like, okay, brain Lord together, together. Yeah. yeah. We, we just kind of cruised through like the first, like, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 yeah. minutes together. Yeah. So yeah, we got past the title screen and then we saw the, the opening, like, you know, flashback, mm-hmm. which is all in like sepia tones. Very obvious. It's not taking place in a modern setting in the game. Um, and we're or like, wow, maybe this a is... modern setting in time. Or something. Yeah. in in the timeline. Um, and we're like, wow, this is actually pretty cool looking. And then, you get to wake up in the bar from your daydreaming and it's like, well, okay, there's a lot of really cool textures going on. And you're all grown up. You're yeah. All big, you yeah. Know? You're I adult. thought it was going to be like a child the whole way through or something, but no. Nope. Yeah. I mean, in the, in the graphics in this game are, are very cool looking. They were done by a graphics artist by the name of June Kusaka, uh, who also did some stuff for some Hudson games like Super Adventure Island and Super Bomberman 2. And I guess now he works as an animator for Square Enix and did some work on Final Fantasy 10, 12, and 13, and more recently, Drakengard 3. So, uh, this is someone that's still around making art on modern systems, but yeah, I think he did. I, I looked this up too. I think he did like facial animation and like oh, okay. battle sequencing. He also did some stuff for the bouncer, uh, that Square okay, Enix yeah. game from 2000. Uh, so yeah, I mean, he's still in the game doing stuff, and you know, he specifically was doing like the backgrounds, the mm-hmm. the items, the the menu uh, design and stuff like that, and it's all very brilliant bright colors yeah and it's very well designed too there's really uh defined textures that don't appear in other uh you know other areas it's like, not just like a like a what is that um like a stamp right tool in and photoshop then, just da, 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 everywhere. yeah i mean the patterns repeat and things like that but i mean everything has like a unique feel like he's trying to go for like dirt has a unique texture and like you know rocks have a unique texture and it's very very detailed there's a lot going on but it's still really well organized like you said with the bright colors you don't really get lost in all the detail it actually feels really lifelike it's i mean lifelike for a top-down rpg on the super nintendo but there's just so much character going on can i say something you know i think and this is just an opinion but when i think of genesis games a lot of the time i think of like a darker outline Mm -hmm. i notice genesis colors um and there's probably a lot of people that agree with me tend to have like more darker tones to them and it's not because the genesis hardware couldn't do bright happy stuff but this kind of looks more like a Genesis style game in a good way. You know, it it, it has like darker edge work. It seems right. like things are a little bit more defined. You know, colors are separated yeah. a little bit better. And I think um, you do see a lot of games on the Super Nintendo that have a lot of things in the higher range or say instead of using black, it might use purple, like a, a, like right. a darkish purple, not even super dark. Whereas the Genesis did use black a lot and had a lot more lower range colors um because like when we did that uh, ninja turtle episode where we we covered tournament fighters the super nintendo version was very bright and colorful and the suit and the genesis version was a lot darker right um, right right and i think that's just kind of the style the two different systems had right. you know each could do what the other was doing but you know you see a lot of genesis games that look like this and that's a good look so maybe let's emulate that right i mean there were some differences in the graphic capabilities of both systems but it wasn't that the like, colors weren't yeah that it was more right? stylistic I right mean, we right. saw bright fun genesis games like right. restar um <laughs> right 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 so it could do it but um i do see what you're saying here with like there's a lot more dark outlines there's a lot of uh like mid-range and darker colors in this game, which look really great. Yeah. Now, the dark outlines are, are kind of predominant on some of the, the characters and stuff, and that was a different artist. Yeah, so the character design, uh, like you said, has like a really unique look to them. Uh, it's from a graphic artist by the name of Sachiko Kamimura, who's also responsible for Arslan Senki and City Hunter. Oh, City Hunter. That's uh, that Turbo Graphic 16 game. That, that looks incredible. It doesn't look yeah. like this at all. Uh, maybe Arslan Senki has a. You know what? It does actually. I think the characters had like dark outlines mm-hmm. and had yeah, that kind there's of black shadows look. and and yeah. And the the characters look so good in this game. Like it feels uh, very you know 3D when they're turning around. I, I remember and... you brought up the fir- very first thing when we started the game. It, and this is kind of weird. Um, if you don't press any buttons and you're on the title screen, it goes into demo mode. Right. For an RPG, that's like 
Yeah, it gave that, it like that's got to be uncommon. I don't it, think I see that much. Yeah, it, I mean, sometimes you'll go into like some opening cutscene that'll play over and over. Right, and over, right, but right. Like this was showing you gameplay and different dungeons and weapons, and different weapons and stuff. And I remember you brought up something that was really important about the character animation. Mm-hmm. You said, "Oh my God, he's using this flail, and you can see his shoulder bone like swinging." over his head yeah and it, it really looked like you know it's not like his hand went up in the air and this thing just like started spinning in circles yeah, like a little helicopter it looked moving. like he was actually swinging it yeah, around his and legs were moving and i mean these characters are not just um you know looking from the right or from the left i mean they're they come toward you they come away from you and then there's kind of like eight way eight directions right you can see them at an angle and i mean that animation was really complex just for one direction. So it was really beautiful, uh, really fluid looking. It was really cool. When you think of uh, Super Nintendo RPGs, your typical thought is something like, you know, Secret of Mana or, you know, Final yeah. Fantasy 2 or 3. Or, like you know, a four frame walk cycle. For yeah, most of the game. very, very like squared characters. Mm-hmm. You know, they all have to fit within like their 32 by 32 pixel count or whatever. Mm-hmm. This, on the other hand, the characters look more human, like more like the, you know, like their bodies are actually to proportion, you know, it's not like this right. chibi style. And they all have different characters. like shapes too. Like, uh, like Ramir is kind of wide and, but you'll see like, um, girls yeah. that are thin or like someone that has huge shoulders and a big cape that's kind of flowing. It's, I was just really surprised by the amount of detail each little sprite had that made them feel so different. It was very cool. Enemies too. There, there's such variety and such really awesome animations to them. Yeah. So you know, it, it's refreshing. I think coming from a uh, a big fan of RPGs on the Super Nintendo to have something that's so different. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it it doesn't really feel like anything else to me, and um, I, I like that. I, yeah. It just felt like wow, like how did I miss this? Yeah. How did everybody miss this? You know? Yeah. It's, it's really cool. And if other people, some, if more people had seen it, they would say, man, this other game is so brain Lord. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's so, like oh, it it's has so that brain Lord look. Yeah. yeah it's brain Lord. Look. All right. Let's get into some more music. This is actually a really interesting track. Uh, it's kind of, kind of out there, mm-hmm. but I, I think you guys are going to like it. It's called site of civilization composed by Masanao Akahori. <laughs> You just heard The Sight of Civilization, composed by Masanao Akahori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. Wasn't that weird? Wasn't that, that was wild? Very different. Um, it had, I, I had to sneak that one in there, dude. Yeah, yeah no, was... I, I like hearing the, the variety. I mean, because I know this, this game had quite a bit of music. It had like this spacey Metroid-like feel oh, to the totally, beginning. Oh, totally, totally. Uh, At first, I, I kind of passed it up. I was like, eh, it's going to be one of those just like not really music music tracks Mm -hmm. you know it's It's more like like atmosphere just yeah and it's going to repeat that first part over and over but then like when the guitar comes in that yeah oh my god i was like oh this is so rad yeah and and to me it was really funny because um in the last episode with gene gene picked a genesis track 
it sounded very Super Nintendo like. I think it might have been the track we came in with. It was super bright and fun and happy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. this is a Super Nintendo track that feels kind of Genesis like. <laughs> it's very grungy and and gritty, and I thought it was really kind of cool. Yeah, man. Yeah, it was so weird. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just had this weird space uh, feel to it, uh, like. To me, with the the idea of the site of civilization, it made me think of like some space oasis. Oh like, yeah, is this like some haunted spaceship I just found? Is it real? Is yep, it not? Yep, like yep. that was kind of neat. Yeah. All right, let's get into our next track. This is the Platinum Shrine, composed by Masanao Akahori for Brain Lord. <laughs> I still hate that name, dude. Yeah. Brain Lord. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, whatever. It's a great game. Uh, Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. Maybe there is a brain lore that we just don't know about. Maybe they live in that platinum shrine. <laughs> the the Lord of Brains. Yeah. Uh, so it could be some alien thing or maybe uh, something takes over Ramir's dad and he has to fight him. Takes yeah. over his brain. I don't know. <laughs> that was Platinum Shrine composed by Masanao Akahori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. This track is, I feel, is very wild because there's like the flutes in the yeah. beginning. And I just imagine some guy like on stage with like an electric flute and he's just like doo, 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 and it's like, like that, really into it it's like that uh what is that movie um uh anchorman where like ron burgundy you know uh will ferrell like goes and starts playing like jazz flute or something oh yeah yeah something <laughs> like that which is like way over the top and the guy's like really having fun but um it was really fast paced and right after that flute part there's like there's kind of like a train sound like you know when you blow in those wood blocks to make the oh, train noise? yeah 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 but it's yeah. like way faster and i was just like this song is so weird and <laughs> fun and fast paced and kind of trippy and wild which uh like like it really makes me want to know what's going on in this platinum area for the last level uh, i know platinum shrine maybe the brain lord is there yeah maybe that's just what it is um so we talked about our opinions and we think it's an excellent game the public had some pretty good reviews to say about it right Different yeah editors and review sites and stuff oh yeah it was it was very nice to see that a lot of the places that had played this game and reviewed it were giving it you know anywhere from like a 78 to an 84 out of 100 so i mean that's a really good score even yeah. by today's standards i mean that's i mean that's a low b uh, or, or a high b even. yeah yeah so i mean it's it's good to see but sadly it just seems like this game is overshadowed by some of the other massive rpgs that were released or you know around the mid 90s so that's the problem i think you know like you see you know everybody the craze was you know final fantasy chrono trigger secret of mana all these other square enix games mm -hmm. this just kind of got put on the wayside you know people just overlooked it and it's a shame you know not even people. I'd say like the developers, like Square Enix, has basically forgotten that this game even existed. Right. Um, and it's, you know the same could be said for me. I, you know, I didn't know about it at all until I had heard the soundtrack. You know, because I was listening to everything years back. Mm -hmm. But I had completely just passed it up, just thinking like, eh, whatever. You know, it's probably another crap game or something yeah and it seems like it's like that in every region like i mean i was talking to a friend from sweden he's like yeah i've i've seen this game at different conventions and stuff like that people selling it but i've never tried it don't know what it is or anything like that and he's they were even like the title sounds kind of dumb yeah so our so our whole you know the whole thing about this episode is we're hoping you guys give it a shot mm -hmm. you know we uh we fell in love with it and you know we don't just fall in love with every kind of game because it's retro or you know right we have we really 
take the time to get into something. If a game sucks, we'll tell you. We'll tell you it sucks, you know. And yeah. there's been plenty of those. Yeah, um, there definitely this, has been. Yeah, but this game, you give it a shot. I think it's I think it's worth it. Yeah. So I mean, this this game was right up our alley. It's a a great soundtrack. It's a beautiful game that's fun and exciting and was overlooked. And that's yep. kind of like what we like to do. We like to find games that people missed. And there was really no good reason why it wasn't popular. You know, and it's different too. It's different. It mm-hmm. gives this refreshing kind of change of pace from what everybody sees as your typical Super Nintendo RPGs. Mm-hmm. And that I think is the most important thing. Yeah. No, I definitely want to play all the way through this game. Probably start over and just do like a one, one, you know, one sitting. Well, probably not one sitting, sesh. but like, yeah, just like right in a row, like not, not play something in between, just kind of get through it and be like, wow, that was a really cool experience. Yep. Now there is the next track we're going to play. Actually, um, there is a uh, unused track in the game. Mm-hmm. It was written, composed for the game, but just never used apparently. So we're going to listen to that. It's called unused song. I mean, you can call it whatever you want. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> call it, you know, Brain Lord in the Platinum Shrine. I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think we can call this song Masanao. Akahori takes Huey Lewis for a bike ride. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. That's some some 80s pop right there. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this song has alternate uh, credits track written all over it. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Or closing cutscene type thing. Yeah. Kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, you know, very fun, very uplifting, kind of has that feeling of like, you did it, it's over, like the sun is coming out type thing, um, which I like. It was a beautiful track, very fun, lots of um, cool minimal parts where there were little chimes that would pop up in there, mm-hmm. uh, lots of highs and lows. I mean, some of the high end really got like some crazy riffs going on, and it was just a really fun track. Yeah, I wonder why. I don't know why it wasn't used you know like i mean maybe maybe it just didn't fit anywhere yeah it's possible you know because it, it isn't to the story or they had something else that they liked better and uh, didn't want to uh like fit another track in there yeah but you know awesome we get to listen to it at least you know that it's it's not in the game but it's in the in the rom so yep it's in there all right so uh cool track let's move on to another track this is called road to drogue
right, you just heard The Road to Drogue, composed by Masanao Akahori for Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo. I thought it was great. You know, the beginning part has this kind of soft, almost like you're uh, listening to uh, like a trumpet in like a grand hall, mm-hmm. that, that first part of the melody. And then when it switches, the transition over to that kind of like a electric daddy guitar mm-hmm. was really interesting because it, it almost had like a like a very western composer kind of feel to it with like the twinkly mm-hmm. arpeggios in the background i don't know it just had more of a western vibe to me but then when you get back into that that first phase it uh that first melody part then it, it you know transitions back to a more you know eastern like japanese style composition mm-hmm. very interesting to me i thought it was an excellent track yeah, I, I also really like this track quite a bit, but I was a little bit surprised when um, when I realized that this is the the song for the second to last dungeon. I was surprised that it was so upbeat. Um, it felt uh, a little bit happier than what I would than what I would have expected for the second to last. Like you shouldn't level. be this happy yet, right? Or like it, <laughs> it it kind of almost felt semi silly in a way. I think because it was so happy for mm. so late in the game. Um, but it was a great track. I love listening to this one. Um, it has such amazing variety and still re- still retains this cohesive song. Like, yeah, there's so yeah. much going on in it, but it doesn't feel like it's chopped up uh, from you know different parts from different songs mashed together. It feels like it all goes together really nicely. But I mean, this is definitely a track that I like to listen to outside of the game. Oh yeah, big time. I mean, I haven't played the game to where this song actually plays. Yeah. So. And it's like I a volcano what... too. So I also like that it didn't seem to really follow any like volcano tropes like yeah. you hear like ice music sounds like this and fire music sounds like this. Uh, I thought it was really nice to kind of get away from that. <laughs> uh, again, we're hearing those kind of Konami, you mm-hmm. know, orc hits in there, and I, you know, I I could always kind of do without those, but you yeah, know, whatever. It it gives like a like a pressing kind of feel. Well, I mean, they were so popular back then that, Mm -hmm. I mean, you want to do it because they're doing it. Yeah. All right. So I guess that about wraps things up. You know, we played a lot of music today. We Mm -hmm. covered Brain Lord on the Super Nintendo composed by Masanao Akahori. Yeah. And by no means was that all the soundtrack. There's definitely more out there for you guys to listen to if you're Mm -hmm. interested. But if you want to know more about us, you can find us online at pixelatedaudio.com for show notes and track lists. We can also be found on most social media outlets like Twitter, at Pixelated Audio. And we'd really like to chat with you guys on Discord. So if you're interested in Discord, you can find a link to our server on our website. Yep. Also want to invite you guys to leave some feedback or comments. You know, if you like this music, go on to the website. Um, It's going to be pixelatedaudio.com slash 90 because we have all of our short links like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Tell us your thoughts about the soundtrack. What tracks do you guys like? What stood out to you? What? Uh, how was that Huey Lewis track? You know, like yeah. tell us. Tell us your thoughts. If you like the show, leave us a review on iTunes. Mm-hmm. That's always a, a a great way to kind of inspire us to keep going. Yeah. We also have a Patreon. So if you want to support the show, that would be awesome. You know, any anything you guys want to uh, donate our way is always appreciated. Uh, if you have suggestions, uh, James mentioned the Discord server. You know, please by all means. Uh, if there's something you guys you got to listen to this, you got to do an episode. I want to hear yeah. uh, your guys' take on it. Then please uh, leave it in the uh, suggestion box. Yeah, I mean, and once again, thanks to Cameron for suggesting this game. This was not a game that that you Brian and I really would've... knew a lot about, and right. uh, so it was really cool for us to discover something that you guys could send our way. Yep. And if you're new to the podcast, I mean. We're getting really high up there now, 90 episodes. It's pretty crazy. So yeah. we have a big backlog, and some of the episodes we'd like to highlight are some of our recent ones, like our Sega Genesis expansion pack with our good buddy Gene. We also covered Dragon Fighter on the NES, which is another great hidden gem, and also Tekamon Blade for the Game Boy, which was really cool that soundtrack. Was, that was fun. I almost forgot we did that one. Yeah. <laughs> that was a fun soundtrack. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a fun game, too. Very unique. And we've got a lot of exciting ideas for shows down the road, mm-hmm. too. we got some some big stuff in mind. Hopefully everything works out, but uh, we'll get there when we get there, I guess. Yep. Uh, the track taking us out, and this is a really nice kind of mellow track to take out the show. This is the epilogue. So you beat the game, and this is the track you get. Uh, it's just super soothing, and I think you guys are going to like it a lot. Anyways, thanks so much for listening, and we will see you back in a few weeks for the next episode.